Hey everybody. So time for another midweek chat here. It, it is March 29th, right? Yeah. Wednesday, March 29th. And I'm in a really beautiful spot. I, I have the camera in a box, so I'm hoping that'll shelter it from the west northwest wind today. Uh, it was a little breezy last week. Um, so, oh, I'm gonna have to study. Look at the box is blowing in the wind. Okay. Wow. Maybe this won't work. Well, let's that'll work. Ah. I need. I'm near, right near the bike trail. I'm getting excited about the new weather coming, and we'll have our parish bike ride starting, and hopefully late April. I would think by then, maybe by May. Uh, so I got some parish news. I got some thoughts about. Uh, God's love and Jesus and um, getting ready for Holy Week and all. Let's just kind of run through some. So we do have some. I'm not sure if people volunteered or they were just uh, pursued by Patrice and Christine, but we have some cross bearers for our Good Friday uh, service. Um, gosh, I can't remember who they were. They, they named them for me, and they're they're three uh, three good guys. So that's that's good and people to set up too. Um, tonight, if you happen to catch this chat early on Wednesday, tonight we're having, uh, at eight o'clock, we're gonna have night prayer, like a Liturgy of the Hours night prayer. Mary and Bob um, Lisneski uh, uh, arranged that for us. So I'm gonna go, that should be nice. Um, Stations of the Cross this Friday, two opportunities with the school community at 2.50. Um, last thing to do before school lets out. And uh, then at 7 p.m. Um, without the school community, <laughs> other people leading that. So that's good. Hey, the pool tournament went well last uh, last Friday um, or last Sunday afternoon. It was, we had uh, nine people show up, and that was good. We had three teams of three, played a little cutthroat. It was the race to four. Three teams had three wins. And we thought, we thought Mike's team was just going to take off and, and just win. And the uh, and then my team caught up, and then and then we thought well, it was between us because the other team just had one win, and uh, then they got two wins, so we were all deadlocked at three wins, and we had a final final match, so it was pretty exciting. And so instead of taking two hours, it ended up taking three hours. But I think everybody who came had a had a pretty good time. I mean, it was Al's birthday too that day, which we didn't realize at the time, but um, it was good to celebrate with him. Hey, they're still looking for some uh, uh, Easter plastic Easter eggs and Easter candy, individually wrapped candies that uh, Beth and her pals can put together for our Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday. So if you want to bring any of those things over to the office, be m much appreciated. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, well, next, this what we have coming up is... Uh, Ash, or not Ash Wednesday, the other end of Lent, Palm Sunday. Um, so I think we got enough palms for everybody. Uh, Patrice is going to take some over to the uh, Dove West where we serve, and um, uh, the religious ed students are going to get some tonight, I think. So hopefully we'll have enough for everybody. Uh, we always try to order plenty. A um, couple years it gets scarce. Um, I think we always have to kind of plan on some people just taking a handful, and 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 I. That's, if they go to people that want them and people they love, I suppose that's great. And I think we budget for that. So um, you might come to 10 o'clock and then get a little scarce. But I heard we have uh, 1,100, 1,200 palms. So hopefully that's enough. Um, let's see. So, th so that'll be good. We'll see on the weather. It's cold today and it's going to get colder tonight. Um, I think it's going to get wicked cold tonight. I remember seeing a, a thermometer once. I always liked it. It was like New England gifts or something, how to speak New England. And um, the thermometer said like, I don't know, 40 to 25 was cold. You know, it just said cold on that part of the dial. And then like 25 to 10 or something was wicked cold. And uh, so right now it's just cold. It's like 32, it'll get wicked cold tonight. And then below that though, when it gets below zero, then it's some wicked cold. So it's gonna get wicked cold tonight. I'm not sure it's gonna get some wicked cold, but if it is, you know, we can label it appropriately. There are some joggers on the bike trail. Um, this is pretty though, I love this. So if, I, if you're going that way, you'd see uh, a lot of the university buildings. So that's about where I am. And right above me there is 
I can't read it. My um, looks like a science hall, human, human science, human sciences building. I think the School of Social Work is up there, maybe. I saw Nick Smyer. He was a big social work, School of Social Work figure. I think he's retired now, but he's still getting around and being expert around the globe. I saw he and his wife at the Amber Inn a couple of months ago, and, and we had a nice talk. It was nice. Um, so. Yeah, Palm Sunday. And depending on the weather, that's where I start it. If it's super cold, then we'll we'll begin in the gathering space with the proclamation of the preamble. But I, I hope we can go outside, you know. And if people want to stay inside, that's good. We hope that our microphones will be, you'll be able to hear if you stay inside. There's always the pre-gospel on Palm Sunday, and then the procession in with the palms, and then mass as usual with the proclamation of the passion. Again, um, so we'll proclaim it on Palm Sunday, Seems like people really embraced it and see the value in it, as, as I do. Um, we'll do it in parts, like it is in the Missalette. But instead of uh, the people being the crowd, the people will be Jesus. And I'll be one of the, I'll be the narrator, I think. And then the different readers will be the, the voice of the crowd or the voice or some, something like that. There's, uh, there's three parts and then Jesus. But it makes sense that the people can be Jesus. Because, um, you know, you are. You're, you're all the body of Christ. The people of God assembled are, you know, Jesus. And so we're not, we won't make you yell, crucify him. Though there is something to that, a full church of other people saying, crucify him. You get the feeling of the mob a little bit, but whatever advantage that might be, I think there's a greater advantage of as many people as possible stepping into the role of Jesus to empathize with him, to uh, feel as he feels. And I think that's that's easier to do when you're speaking his part. So we'll be reminded of that uh, before the liturgies, so people don't mess up. And, you know, I think I think we'll get it. It's amazing. On I don't know on Matthew's is, but it's amazing how little, how few parts Jesus actually has in the Passion. Some people make the um, connection that Passion. You know, I think it means suffering. We think of passion as exuberance and, you know, feeling I have a passion for basketball or something like that. And I don't think that's, pri I think it's primarily passio. I think it means suffering. So the suffering of Jesus. But um, but there's also that element where it means passivity. And so Jesus has this very active life. And when he enters into his passion, it's basically there's a lot of stuff done to him. And he becomes a rather passive actor, especially in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Uh, we'll be hearing from Matthew on, on Palm Sunday. A little less so in John. He has, he's more, um, he has a conversation with Pontius Pilate. and He's just a little more active there, a little more in control of events. Um, but I, you know, it's appropriate. So a lot of us in our suffering, it's when we're just at, you know, we're at the mercy of our bodies, if it's physical suffering or at the mercy of circumstances. And we, you know, it's the serenity prayer. Let me change what I can, but sometimes there's things I can't change. And let me accept it and endure it in faith. And that's what Jesus does during his passion, you know. Yeah. So, you know, we have the whole whole thing coming up. That we call it the Triduum. So that one liturgy, Mass of the Lord's Supper, Good Friday of the Lord's Passion, and the Easter Vigil is our, our one liturgy. Holy Week, and I'll, I'll mention that next week too, because next week's chat will be the day before Trudeau and begins. Um, but to really enter into that and try to feel, empathize with Jesus, try to feel what Jesus feels in his story, and then that might help us, and as we go through life and our suffering and our trials, our challenges, to know that he is with us in our suffering, that we are living out our passion in our own way. You know, I mean, think about those families whose children were shot and killed in Nashville two days ago. You know, I mean, they're living out the passion. It, it's just, I can't imagine. You know, all the frustration that, you know, nothing ever changes, this keeps going on. People that are, have a real history that you wouldn't think they should be able to buy guns do. And I don't know, uh, just a lot of frustration. How come, how come? How come this keeps happening? How come nothing, we don't seem to try to do anything to change it, you know? And, or we do, but nothing happens. And, um, you know, so a lot of this is, it's entering like the passion of Christ and, and 
and he is uh, enters his suffering, and we he suffers with us when we go through these things. Um, so, um, so there's that, you know. And then, um, what else happens? Let's see, school, school. My school mass today was it was pretty it was pretty good. I, <laughs> there was a re with school liturgies you have a little latitude about like what um, children's liturgies, what readings you read. There's kind of a long gospel, and it was really I thought hard for me to understand. So I didn't really want to make the kindergartners through fifth graders hear it all kind of long and and um, but the beginning was interesting. It was that just that one we just did two verses and then ended with. Um, the, the, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free Jesus tells us and uh, so I just asked the, I just asked the children I said what does that mean to you I didn't ex initially I asked these questions and they're they're a little I don't phrase them right and they're a little hard to answer but I thought, well, I'll ask because we we were going to talk about um, King Nebuchadnezzar putting Meshach Shadrach and Abednego in the fiery furnace because that's that's a nice story for children but I thought, well let's just throw out a more difficult question maybe to start and I said what do you think Jesus means when he says the truth will set you free? And uh, gosh, you know who answered a lot were the first graders, and and they gave some. They really got us off on a good start. Well, they're like, well, you know, if you if you if you tell the truth, you know, then you're then you're you'll you know you get to heaven. You'll be you'll be good, and that you know this had the sense if you tell the truth, that's the right thing to do. And that'll uh, that'll help you. That'll make you. That'll make you free. If you lie, you just sort of feel bad. And you know, I think one of them said, you know, if you they're probably used to if they if they lie, if their parents catch them in a lie, there's some consequence, some punishment. You know, so they said, you know, if you lie, um, if you if you tell the truth, you'll be free of punishment. You know, so that was interesting from the first graders. And then they got a little bit older. Um, one I thought was really the most interesting, and I can't quote it, but it was really clear what what he or she was saying. Can't remember which gender, um, but said, uh, let's "See, if I tell the truth to somebody," he said, "It's kind of like a he says sort of like a gift. If I tell the truth to somebody, then they'll like that because it's true, and then and then they'll be truthful. They'll tell me the truth, or if I lie to somebody, they might lie to me." And, and the whole gist of the thing was it builds relationships. And then we can be friends. We'll be friends. I thought that's pretty, that's very deep. The truth will set you free. It, it frees us for honest, beautiful, intimate relationships. And there's a freedom in that, right? And uh, I think that's really what they were saying, even though at the tender age, you know, um, which I thought was great. Uh, and then the... Uh, fourth grader fifth grader said um said like well if i if i tell the truth and i, th I think the background i, I confirmed this way. so uh, the background of the story is that somebody wants to know who did something and, and you did it so if i confess if i tell the truth that i did something wrong he goes then i then the, he goes then the whole then it's just a re there's just a release <laughs> he goes it's just a release it's like there's freedom it's like I don't have to worry anymore. It's like it's like you know how when you're when you did something wrong and you're trying to get away with it and you're not. What is that? I got a like a peanut. I think I had a nut on the way over, like a peanut skin. Anyway, so yeah, the truth will set you free. Just just get it out. If you if you did something wrong, just confess it, and then you don't have to hide it anymore. And then if somebody finds out later, you know, just just get it out. And of course, what we need are good supportive people around us that encourage us to tell the truth and, wow look at that is that a boat I mean of course it's a boat but wow I guess they're fishing huh it's cold it's 30 degrees out here um, anyway the truth will set you free they had great answers they had really good answers um, so I wanted to share that with you it's nice to be able to gather with the school community for mass each, each week missed them last week on spring break and the servers were excellent tonight. We had we, uh, this morning. Jacob was sort of the mentor. The wind's picking up. Jacob was sort of the mentor server, the fifth grader. And uh, there are two new people that just served for the first time. Lauren was. I knew Lauren would be great. She's a quick study. 
and oh gosh, who's the other one? Michael. So Lauren and Michael, their first mass this morning, serving, it was great. Um, and Jacob showed them the way. Uh, well, let's see, we have, I have, between now and next chat, I will go to the cathedral for the Chrism Mass. Priests renew their um, vows every year at the Chrism Mass. Sometimes it's on Holy Thursday morning. Most priests like myself prefer it on Holy Tuesday or sometime earlier than Holy Thursday because we got a lot going on on Holy Thursday in the evening. Um, but so I'll go down and they call it the Chrism Mass because I bring back the holy oils. We uh, burn or reverently dispose of our holy oils. Um, from last year and we get new ones. The, the chrism is the main one. We use that for uh, baptizing and we use that for uh, confirmations. So we'll be using the new oils at Easter Vigil when we confirm our four candidates. It'll be really excellent and when we baptize Nathan, you know. Looking forward to that. Uh, Patrice, uh, with Jackie's help, Jackie, our veteran who's gone, done it for years, is kind of helping Patrice uh, plot all that out this year with her because Patrice is doing what Jackie used to do and other things. So, but anyway, I'll bring that, that chrism oil back and renew my vows as a priest. And I hope, if I remember, I got to call down to the La Crosse Food Co-op and order some snack bars. I usually get like at least four dozen and bring them back. And the challenge is to limit myself to one a day. They're so good. They're so good. They're just called snack bars. It's the greatest, it's the greatest understatement in the food industry. They're so good. <laughs> snack bars. I don't know what you call them, you know, paradise bars or something, I suppose. It's basically kind of a granola bottom, oats and honey, and uh, I think some butter, some cream, uh, sunflower seeds, wheat germ, kind of in a tightly packed, somewhat chewy peanut butter. Um, and there's this barley sweetened chocolate on top. It's just really good. And they freeze well, so I get a whole bunch, put them in Ziplocs, and I have enough for hopefully more than a month, but sometimes they go kind of fast. I try to share them too. But. Um, let's see. I think that's kind of most of the things that are going on in the parish. Um, um, the Pope's sick. So that was a notifi new notification I got today that the Pope is sick. He's got like a lung infection. Um, so we want to pray for him. I thought, you know, maybe it's just a good opportunity in these chats to think of a, a things to pray for. I mean, we pray for the, the well-being of the Pope. He, he gave a great talk this morning that I'll, I'll, I'll mention. But then later in the day, they said, he's got to go in, he's got a test. And they said they're going to keep him in for several days to treat him for this lung infection. So they ruled out COVID, according to the press, what they said. So it's not COVID, but there's a lung infection. He's got like half a lung anyway, or like one whole lung and a half of the other. He had a disease when he was a, a teen or early 20s where they had to remove a lot of his lung. So I hope he's doing well. It's hard to, everyone tells me, you know, and I'm starting to see the truth of it. It's hard to get old. Um, so I pray for him, pray for all those, uh, hurting in Nashville, you know, pray for all the refugees from the Ukraine war and the ones who continue to be refugees from Syria and other places in the world, other places we don't hear from that maybe a peace can be sustained. Like a half million people died in Northern Ethiopia, Tigray, and Eritrea. I, I don't think they're still fighting, but just, oh. So we can trust that to Mary. And why don't we say a Hail Mary? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We pray for peace. Amen. So, um, Let's see. I thought I would mention a little bit. Uh, I mentioned the Pope gave this talk, right? And it was really good. And he was just talking about Jesus. And just this morning, the same day he went in the hospital. And um, I'll just tell you what he talked about. He was talking about St. Paul's conversion. I'm not sure why, because that feast is January 25th. But I know I checked the date on the article. It was from this morning. And uh, he said, becoming Christian is is uh, more than putting makeup on your face. He was trying to motivate people at his audience this morning 
to really have Jesus make a difference in their lives. So he said, being Christian is more than putting makeup on your face. It takes, it, it, it involves true change that takes place in your heart. So not just a superficial thing on your face, but a true change that takes place in your heart. I wrote down these notes, so. So it's not a matter of understanding and study. He said, studying is important, but it doesn't generate a new life of grace. It does, just studying in itself isn't gonna pull you into that saving relationship with, with Christ. A new life of grace. Uh, and I think of that, you know, I, I have to say I was, um, I suppose arrogant is the correct word. I hate saying I was arrogant. Probably still am. I don't mean to say I'm not now. But, um, the, uh, you know, because I took, I took a second major in, in theology when I was in, in college. And I, I don't know, I think I was kind of cocky about it. Like I knew more about religion than my parents or that, you know, my friends. And, and uh, you know, then, you know, then you, you, you learn later that how wrong that is to, to use your knowledge about religion or Bible as power to, to make, to build yourself up because it's all about service. And Palm Sunday, the second reading, we'll hear how uh, Jesus, the Son of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at or clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And so that's, that's the goal. The more power we have, the more power we have to serve not the more power we have to elevate ourselves, you know. And so and I've done a fair of that in my day, elevating myself because of what I think I know, and, and which isn't that much really. Um, but anyway, anyway, so he said, he, and so I liked what he said. He said, you know, so studying isn't, um, it, it doesn't get you there. It's, it's, the end goal is a saving relationship with Christ that, you know, connects you with God and puts fire in your belly with love for God and love for others. And maybe studying can be a catalyst. I mean, I remember studying about St. Paul and his epistles in, in seminary, and it affected me spiritually. It wasn't just a head thing about how Peter said, you know, everything that I gained in the world, all the trophies and all the awards, and he didn't use those words, but you know, all the all the accolades, all the praise I got for, be, for being a great law keeper, being a good observant Jew, you know, which I was. He said, um, he said, I don't count any of that to my credit anymore. I could just throw all that, all those awards and certificates in the garbage. Doesn't mean a thing to me after having met Christ Jesus. That's the only, that's the only thing that matters to me now. It's just maintaining my relationship with Christ and his grace. And it's nothing that I earned. It's just a gift, you know? And so I remember, I remember reading that and hearing that. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm kind of like that. You know, I, I rely on, you know, I get my, I was, thought I was important because I was good at a sport or I, you know, I, I achieved this or I, you know, got this grade or, and I'm hearing Paul say, none of that matters. It's all, so it's okay, but it's it's not what matters as far as your soul and your salvation and healing and all those important things. It's about accepting the free gift of God's love and mercy shown to us, you know, so clearly in Jesus. Um, so anyway, sometimes studying helps. It's, it's always good. and um, But but it doesn't generate in itself a new life of grace. We can know the Bible back and forth, but it definitely doesn't touch our heart. He says, ask yourself, what does Jesus mean to me? Have I let him into my life or do I keep him at arm's length? Arm's length. Oh gosh. I'll have to get that. I said arm's length and then what, okay. it looks like it's in a, I think if I let go of this box, it's gonna blow away. But I don't want to litter on the on the shoreline either, because it's in a beautiful place. So let me just get this. Okay, okay. Almost lost it there, huh? Okay. All right. The things we go through. That's for a good cause. I didn't litter. Um, Let's see, oh, I gotta get back on my, I got this pad so I don't. All right. Okie doke, here we are back here. Okay. Do I keep him at arm's length? I'm not gonna act that out again. Or do I let him into my life? Do I let myself be changed by Jesus? Or is he just an idea to me? Okay, so those are the questions he asked this morning. Um, 
You said it's like a fire, and I, I appreciate this, but I don't think it's really been my experience. And I don't, but if it's yours, it's great. He says, having Jesus in your life is like a fire. He says, you want to talk about Jesus. You want to help people. You want to do good things. And I think that's awesome if you have that experience. I don't think it's the only way to have a, have a relationship with Christ and necessarily be revved up emotionally. But, but it's beautiful. It's a grace if you have that. Um, so it made me think, you know, um, what do we, how do you have that personal relationship with Jesus? That's always the thing. So I'm, I'm across the river from the campus in the late nineties and mid nineties, I started in campus ministry right there. I lived across the street for seven years. And one of our constant challenges was these good Catholic kids would come out of uh, high school and they never had that relationship with Christ. They might've known what the seven sacraments were or, you know, uh, some moral doctrines, but they didn't have a real life spirituality. And so they'd get to these other groups that were more fundamental Christian and they'd say, hey, you guys have a personal relationship with Christ? And, and they'd say, uh, what do you mean? And, and then they'd say, well, you know, uh, uh, Jesus came from, from God and, and, and we were sinners and, and, uh, and we're not going to heaven, you know, unless we accept Jesus into our heart and he's right there for us. And no matter what we've done in our life and no matter uh, how bad we've been, his mercy is there for us. If we just confess our faith in him and then everything will be reconciled and we're assured of heaven and, and we're gone. And, and a lot of them said, wow, I never heard anything like that before. And uh, I think uh, I want to go to your meeting, you know? And then they said, like, you know, bye-bye. You know, they, le they left the church and went to this other thing. And, uh, you know, and there's differences. There's differences in the faith. But, the, you know, I think we all want to, I mean, the different faiths, have people have a personal relationship with Jesus. Certainly, <laughs> certainly as a Catholic priest, I want people to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And uh, so how do, how do we have that? How do we have that? And I'll say historically, I was always much more, we have our confirmation students and I interview them and I'm like, you know, how, what's your prayer life like? And da, 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 do, you, do you feel more prayerful, easy, easier for you to pray to Jesus or easier to pray to God? And, and uh, usually, I think they usually say God. And, and for me, that was the answer until my 30s. And then it was kind of a little half and half. And I'd say now in my 50s, it's for sure Jesus. And I, I kind of thank Father Schutz for that, who I lived with here at, in Eau Claire. He always said that. He goes, oh, I just, I've just accepted Jesus as, I just go to Jesus. It's just, it's just easier, he goes. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and I find that that's true. Um, but so a personal relationship with Jesus may be most common. You know, what is it anyway? You could say, well, it's just, I talk to him at the end of the day. Maybe it's just, you close your eyes, you know there. Maybe your eyes are open and, and you know that he's there and he's there listening to you and, and hopefully you make some time to listen to him. Maybe people are visual and they have like, I have, I like, I like icons. Uh, I got this here. Oh. So, so I really like praying with this uh, or an image like that. Other people, he looks maybe stern, someone you don't really want to, you know, it looks judgmental, but I don't find that. I just feel like he looks all knowing and he's looking right at my heart and, and he knows me and he loves me and I can just a way to focus. Remember last week I said, God looking at you? It's like Jesus looking at me there. He knows me and loves me. Anyway, so that's, that's like one way, the direct way, have a relationship. I had a professor called uh, uh, John Shea and he said he was talking once and uh, a student came after after class and said, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? And he didn't have that kind I just talked about. So he said, well, and he thought about it. Then the next day he said, you know, uh, I have a personal relationship with Jesus insofar as if you tried to describe me, who is, who is John? And you gave an explanation and you never mentioned Jesus. You wouldn't even be close to describing who I am. And at the time, I really, I really liked that because I didn't necessarily have that emotional kind of like, I'm going to talk to Jesus kind of thing. And uh, I thought, well, that's kind of neat. And I still like it. Um, but I think now, especially this Lent, I've been trying to do that more. Remember, I was, I was uh, moved and I was in the Holy Land at the multiplication of loaves story where Jesus said, bring them to me, bring them to me. So I, I took that as bring me your life. Tell me about your life each night. So I've been trying to do that at Lent. And I like it. I like it. Um... What else? I mean, close to 30 minutes. I think if you have this hunger, so maybe you don't have, 
wouldn't say you have a personal relationship with Jesus, but if you have a, with Jesus, but if you have this hunger, take that hunger to Mass, take that hunger to Eucharist, and expect to encounter Jesus there. And if you if you have time and you're not just trying to uh, calm children or anything, you receive Eucharist and just sit there and know this hunger that you have has just been fed, and you might not be able to name it or, or figure out exactly what it means. Um, but feel the love and feel the, the gift that's been given to you in the Eucharist. So there are three ways, I think, with personal relationship. Just kind of like you relate to a friend um, and, and having a life that would be indescribable without Jesus, trying to follow his teachings, you know, et cetera, and in uh, and, uh, and the Eucharist. So I'm, I went over time again, and uh, so I'm going to just, I'm going to close it, and I hope that was somewhat interesting, some of that. But I'm going to just duck so you can kind of see this. <sighs> pretty, isn't it? Lord, help us prepare for Holy Week. Help us welcome however you approach us. Help us to see the goodness in Jesus, the saving power in Jesus. And, uh, you know, if it's your will, open our hearts a little bit more to, to grow in closer relationship with him these last days of Lent and Holy Week. God bless you guys. Bye.